Today we are going to study a very important subject, and that is the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement in Prophecy. Let us open our Bibles in the second epistle of Peter, chapter 1, and we read from verse 16, Second Peter 1, 16 onwards. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. The Apostle Peter had an experience with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he knew it because he was eyewitness. And then he said to the believers that we made known unto you Jesus Christ, not following cunningly devised fables. But we are eyewitnesses. We have seen, we have heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And I believe that no one could convince Peter that Jesus was not the Son of God because he had his own personal experience. And an experience is very important. The Bible tells us in the next verse, and Peter assures us, in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter says that the word of prophecy is to be trusted more than in his own experience. Prophecy is stronger than one's conviction. Prophecy is stronger than one's experience. And the prophecy is so important because it is a light, a light that shines in darkness and shows the way where we are going to. And where there is no prophecy, then the people perish. Or as in some other Bibles in Proverbs it says, the people become corrupt. Therefore, today we want to examine the reform movement based in prophecy. Because if we do not substantiate our existence based on prophecy, we may be just wasting our time. And in this study, we will use very much the writings of Ellen White, the spirit of prophecy, because I believe that we all believe in the spirit of prophecy. Doctrine, prophecy, and history are the three, three important things in our study. But in this study, we will focus our attention mainly on prophecy. 
if we ask a Seventh-day Adventist, what is their prophetic basis for their existence, they go directly to Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, which says, unto 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And that prophecy takes us to the year 1844, which was the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Although the church was organized later, but the movement began in that year when the people of the Advent received light on the sanctuary question and they understood that Jesus had entered in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to accomplish the final work of atonement. And they understood that already in 1844. So that was the basis of the Advent movement, the beginning of the Advent movement. And in the book Evangelism, page 221, I read this important statement. The correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. The correct understanding of the sanctuary doctrine is the foundation. And that was understood in the early days of the Advent movement in 1844. And that is the foundation of our faith. Not long after the beginning of the Advent movement, this is what was stated about the church in Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 101. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. But where do we behold the true Advent Spirit, who are preparing to stand in the time of temptation which is just before us? The people to whom God has entrusted the sacred solemn testing truth for this time are sleeping at their post. They say by their actions, we have the truth. We are rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. While the true witness declares, Thou knowest not that thou wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. With what fidelity do these words portray the present condition of the church? Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Messages of warning dictated by the Holy Spirit are borne by the servants of God. Defects of the character are presented before the erring, but they say, that does not represent my case. I do not accept the message you bring. I am doing the best I can. I believe the truth. Although these statements portrays the condition of the church in 1882, it is important to notice that the condition of the Laodicean church is mentioned here. But that condition of the church was applicable to the Adventist church earlier. And I read from early writings, page 107 and 108. As I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, 
my mind has been much exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal like the nominal churches from which they but a short time since separated. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. They are neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. And unless they heed the counsel of the faithful and true witness and zealously repent and obtain gold tried in the fire, white raiment and eye cell, he will spew them out of his mouth. This testimony was given to the church in the year 1852, published in Review and Herald of June 10, 1852. And here this, the servant of the Lord says that the church is becoming just like the churches from which they have separated a short time before. In the Encyclopedia, the commentary series of the Seventh-day Adventists, volume 10, page 10, this is written about the origin of Adventist church. Seventh-day Adventists, a group that separated from the aforementioned two groups, Evangelical Adventists and Advent Christians, in 1845, and organized as a denomination in 1860 and 1863. Seventh-day Adventists have separated themselves from these churches, Evangelical Adventists and Advent Christians. And the Spirit of Prophecy says that they were becoming just as formal and cold as these churches from which they have separated just a short time before. And the condition of Laodicea was applicable to the church as early as 1852. And the hope of the church was depending on this, accepting the counsel of the faithful and true witness by gold tried in the fire, white raiment, and eye self. Unless they would buy these goods, they would be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. In this statement, we realize that there were two classes of people in the church, some faithful and some unfaithful. These two classes of people are referred to later in Testimonies, Volume 5, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 101. The pure and the base metal are now so mingled that only the discerning eye of the infinite God can with certainty distinguish between them. But the moral magnet of holiness and truth will attract together the pure metal while it will repel the base and counterfeit. The two classes of believers in the church was represented here by pure metal and base metal. And these two classes were so mingled together that no one could say who is who. Only God could discern between them. And we read here that the moral magnet of holiness and truth will attract together the pure metal and will repel the base and counterfeit. 
If we put on the table a handful of little nails of iron and brass, and we take a magnet, and we put the magnet there, the magnet will attract all iron, but will not attract the brass. But in this case, it will not only leave the base metal unattracted. It says here that it will repel the base and counterfeit. Have you ever tried to put two positive magnets together? You cannot put them together. One repels the other. When the magnet attracts once and repels the others, what is this? Is it not a separation? Definitely so. Ones are attracted and others are repelled. And that is a separation. Therefore, in this testimony, there is a prediction that there would be a separation between the two classes. However, we do not know yet how much proportion was the faithful compared with the unfaithful. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 136. Volume 5, 136. Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials, and a great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be base metal. Did you notice the proportion? The great proportion will prove to be base metal. And this great proportion will be repelled. Only the true metal will be attracted by the magnet of truth and holiness. And in this testimony does not even say what proportion is the base metal and the pure metal. And these two classes were developing in the church. Year after year, the Spirit of God, through the testimonies, was inviting those base metal to become converted. But the time was passing, and the two classes continued. In 1888, there was a message taken to the church, exactly that message to Laodicea. Counsel to buy white raiment. And in the general conference held at Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1888, in the month of November, it was presented to the church the message Christ our righteousness, which is the counsel to Laodicea. Counsel to buy white raiment. And that message was not accepted. It was rejected by the main leaders. 
And this is recorded in Testimonies to Ministers, page 79, 80, page 90, 91, 92, page 107, page 411. In all these statements, it says that the message was rejected. However, in that conference, there was a separation of opinions. Not anymore two classes, but three classes developed. One class accepted the message. The other class refused to accept the message. And there was one class which was neutral. And in spiritual matters, neutrality should not exist. And after that conference, some have taken their position for the message. Others have taken their position against the message. And the two classes continued. In the year 1893, the spirit of prophecy shows the proportion of that base metal and pure metal. In the book, Christian Service, page 41, we read, It is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in twenty whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. They are professedly serving God, but they are more earnestly serving mammon. This half and half work is a constant denying of Christ rather than confessing of Christ. So many have brought into the church their own unsubdued spirit, unrefined. Their spiritual taste is perverted by their own immoral, debasing corruptions, symbolizing the world in spirit, in heart, in purpose, conforming themselves in lustful practices, and are full of deception through and through in their professed Christian life. Living as sinners, claiming to be Christians, those who claim to be Christians and will confess Christ should come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing, and be separate. In this statement of the Spirit of Prophecy, we read that not one in twenty were pure metal. And what proportion is that? Less than five percent were faithful, and more than ninety-five percent were unfaithful. And here in this testimony, it not only shows the need of separation and prophesy that a separation would come, but there is a call for separation. It says, those who claim to be Christians and will confess Christ should come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing and be separate. Those less than 5% should separate themselves from those more than 95% of unfaithful. We have already this second prophecy about a separation in the church. And we shall consider now Another prophecy about the separation in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, 
page 400. As trials thicken around us, both separation and unity will be seen in our ranks. Did you notice? Separation will be seen in our ranks. On one hand, separation. On the other hand, unity will be seen. Some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare will, in times of real peril, make it manifest that they have not built upon the solid rock. They will yield to temptation. It is interesting that the spirit of prophecy shows under which conditions the separation would take place. It says here, some who are now ready to take up weapons of warfare. There is a controversy about the expression weapons of warfare. Many understand that this a spiritual weapon of warfare. Others understand that this is literal weapons of warfare. If you read the whole chapter, beginning with page 392, and especially from 394, this chapter is entitled, Our Attitude Toward the Civil Authorities. It does not matter whether this is a reference to literal weapons of warfare or spiritual warfare. The important point is that there is a prediction of a separation. And a class will be separated from us. Now, who are these? Us. In volume 5, page 136, again, let us read the statement. Volume 5, 136. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. You notice the use of the pronoun us. Majority will forsake us. So these us are the minority. And therefore, those who have not improved the light and precious privileges under one pretext or another will go out from us. Maybe the great majority will go out from us. But certainly a separation would take place. Because the prophecy says separation will be seen in our ranks. Many good brethren, Seventh-day Adventists, when they talk about the reform movement, they say there is no reason for separation, no prophecy for separation. Here is another one speaking that a separation would be seen in the ranks of the Adventists. And this testimony was written in around the year 1900. And I understand why the spirit of prophecy used these expressions. Those that are now, some who are now, now, in 1900, ready to take up weapons of warfare, when the time of real peril will come, they will show that they did not build upon the solid rock. They will yield to temptation. 
What was the opinion of some in the year 1900? And even before that, let me read a statement from Review and Herald, October 12, 1886. And this is a letter that Elder Butler sent to Ellen White. He sent this letter from Russia. After a long struggle, the Baptists are now tolerated and their preachers have full liberty to preach. They had to admit the bearing of arms and we have to do the same if we are ever tolerated here. This letter was written by Louis Conradi from Russia to Elder Butler. And he had that conviction that if we want to be tolerated in Russia, we have to bear arms like the Baptists do. This was his conviction. And his conviction was not changed until the time of real peril when World War II broke out. That was his conviction. And he led the people to transgress God's law. But we will talk about this more when we will talk about the history of the reform movement. Now we are considering prophecy. And according to this statement in volume 6, page 400, those who at that time in 1900 were ready to take up weapons of warfare, in the time of real peril, they would yield to temptation. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know what are the doctrines of devils? We have seen yesterday. Satan delights in war. And he uses evil spirits. And these evil spirits personify dead generals and warriors. And those who would yield temptation, they would heed to seducing, give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and will depart from the faith. So this is another prophecy about a separation in the Adventist Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church. In great controversy, we are going to consider a further prophecy about separation. Great Controversy, page 608. Great Controversy, 608. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. The spirit of prophecy is speaking about a large class of a people that have believed in the third angel's message. And these people, this large class, cannot be Catholics or Protestants. Because the only ones that believed in the third angel's message are Adventists. And as the storm approaches, before the storm is present, this large class abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. But naturally not everybody will join the ranks of the opposition of the Adventists. There will be some that will remain faithful. However, we read further what will this large class do. 
by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. When the final test will come, they are already prepared to take the easy popular side. We read further. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. Did you notice that there was a separation? When the large class passed the ranks of the opposition, there remained their former brethren. And these men of the large class are men of talent and pleasing address. And they use all their power to deceive souls, and they become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When we read former brethren, that indicates that they are no longer together. There has been a separation. When the Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. So here in this prophecy, there is a prediction of a separation. When will this take place? Not when the storm is present, but as it approaches. From 1890, the spirit of prophecy says that the storm was approaching. In the book, Messages to Young People, page 89, we read, The tempest is coming, and we must get ready for its fury by having repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, The tempest is coming. Tempest or storm is the same thing. And now the spirit of prophecy will tell us what will take place in the time of the approaching of the storm. The Lord will arise to shake terribly the earth. We shall see troubles on all sides. Thousands of ships will be hurled into the depths of the sea. Navies will go down and human lives will be sacrificed by millions. Fires will break out unexpectedly and no human effort will be able to quench them. The palaces of earth will be swept away in the fury of the flames. Disasters by rail will become more and more frequent. Confusion, collision, and death without a moment's warning will occur on the great lines of travel. The end is near. Probation is closing. Oh, let us seek God while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Did you notice what events would take place in the time of the approaching of the tempest? We don't need to bring proofs that these things happened. Disasters in land, in the sea, in the air, not only by the means of transportation, but what about disasters called forth by natural events? All this would take place in the time of the approaching of the tempest. And in any time of the approaching of the storm, a large class of Seventh-day Adventists 
would abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. And there remain their former brethren. So in this statement of Great Controversy 608, we see also that there was a separation. Because on one side remained a large class, and on the other side their former brethren. When we say former brethren, they are no longer together. They are their former brethren. Another statement about separation we read in early writings. We read first on page 269 and then 270. This is the chapter, the shaking. I saw some with strong faith and agonizing cries pleading with God. Their countenances were pale and marked with deep anxiety, expressive of their internal struggle. The servant of the Lord focused her attention to a class of people that they were agonizing with God, they were pleading with God, they were praying, but on the next page, we read on page 270, some I saw did not participate in this work of agonizing and pleading. Here we see two classes of people in the church. Now let us see what took place. They seemed indifferent and careless. They were not resisting the darkness around them, and it shut them in like a thick cloud. The angels of God left these and went to the aid of the earnest praying ones. I saw angels of God hasten to the assistance of all who were struggling with their, all their power to resist the evil angels and trying to help themselves by calling upon God with perseverance. But his angels left those who made no effort to help themselves, and I lost sight of them. In this statement, we find the two classes. One class pleading with God, praying with fervent prayer, and the other class is careless, indifferent, does not take part in this work of pleading. So the angels of God went to help those that were pleading and praying and agonizing and left those who did not take part in this work of pleading and agonizing. And the servant of the Lord says, and I lost sight of them. And when this happened, she was so impressed that she says, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen. And it was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. That separation was understood by the servant of the Lord as a shaking. And she asked the meaning of that shaking. And the angel explained to her that that shaking would be caused by the straight testimony called forth in the counsel of the faithful and true witness to the Laodiceans. Now where do we find that counsel of the faithful and true witness in the Bible? We find it in Revelation chapter 3 verse 18. Revelation 3 18 we read that counsel of Jesus to the church. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye 
that thou mayest see. This counsel to buy these heavenly goods was given to the church. And unless the church would acquire these goods, she would be spewed out from the mouth of the Lord. As we have read in early writing 108. This council, when was presented, caused a shaking among God's people. We read in continuation in the same paragraph. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. When the council to Laodicea was presented to the church, it had an effect. Those that received this council exalted the standard and presented the straight truth, the straight testimony. But many would not bear this straight testimony. And they would rise up against it. This would cause a shaking among God's people. What is that standard that the faithful lifted up or exalted? What is the standard? The Spirit of Prophecy tells us in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 61. Lift up the standard, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God gave us a standard, a banner, on which is inscribed these words, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And those that accepted the counsel of the faithful and true witness, they exalted the standard. And others, they did not, they did not bear this straight testimony. They would rise up against it, and this would cause a shaking among God's people. Now, when we speak about shaking, what do we have in mind when we speak about shaking? You know the word shaking is not found in the Bible. But the word sifting is in the Bible. And this word shaking or sifting is taken from Amos chapter 9 verse 9. The church will be shaken. And what is what is the result of shaking? Let us read in Gospel Workers page 299. God will arouse his people. If other means fail, heresies will come in among them, which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. Did you notice the result of shaking or sifting is separation? And in volume 4, Testimonies for the Church, page 89, we read this. I was pointed to the providence of God among his people and was shown that every trial made by the refining, purifying process upon professed Christians proves some to be dross. The fine gold does not always appear. In every religious crisis, some fall under temptation. The shaking of God blows away multitudes like dry leaves. Prosperity multiplies a mass of professors. Adversity purges them out of the church. As a class, 
their spirits are not steadfast with God. They go out from us because they are not of us. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, many are offended. In this testimony is again mentioned that the shaking of God blows away some. And these some, it says here, may be multitudes. The shaking of God blows away multitudes like dry leaves. So, shaking results in separation. And if there is no separation in view, there is no need for shaking. Let us take the common field. When the farmer gathers in his crop, wheat, barley, rice, or any cereal, he shifts, he fans the wheat or the cereal. For what purpose? Is to separate the chaff from the wheat. If there is no need for separating chaff from the wheat, there is no need for shaking or sifting. Therefore, whenever we read that there is a shaking that always results in a separation. So here in early writings, page 270, the shaking resulted in a separation. Let us read further in early writings 270. I saw that the testimony of the true witness has not been half heeded. The solemn testimony upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. Did you notice when the council to Laodicea was presented to the church, it was lightly esteemed, if not entirely disregarded. But the destiny of the church was depending on this, whether the church would accept this counsel or reject. And as we have read before, if the church would not obtain these celestial goods, the church would be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. And those that would accept we read here, this testimony must work deep repentance. All who truly receive it will obey it and be purified. What is the purpose of shaking? Why do we shake the wheat to purify it from the chaff? In the church, why is it that the shaking has to go on to purify. Now remember that we have read in early writings that the servant of the Lord lost sight of one class, but her attention was drawn to the other class. As we read on page 271, said the angel, Look ye, my attention was then turned to the company I had seen who were mightily shaken. This class of pleading, whom the servant of the Lord did not lose sight of, but her attention was drawn to this class, was now mightily shaken. The shaking did not stop. Now what is the purpose of the shaking of this class? On the next paragraph we read, the numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way. The careless 
and indifferent, who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it, did not obtain it, and they were left behind in darkness. And their places were immediately filled by others, taking hold of the truth and coming into ranks. Evil angels still pressed around them, but could have no power over them. Did you notice what happened in this class that was now mightily shaken? And who is this class? Her attention was drawn to the company that before was seen weeping and praying in agony of spirit. And the number of this class lessened. Who were shaken out of this class? Did you notice? Please mark and underline these words. Careless and indifferent. They were shaken out. A similar prophecy is found in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8. Testimony for the Church, Volume 8, page 251. The time has come for a thorough reformation to take place. When this reformation begins, the spirit of prayer will actuate every believer and will banish from the Church the spirit of discord and strife. In this testimony here, those that have a spirit of discord and strife will be shaken out or will be banished from the church. And which church is this? Which of the two classes? Did you notice when this banishing of the church will begin? Notice carefully, when this reformation begins, the spirit of prayer will actuate every believer and will banish from the church the spirit of discord and strife. From which church? The church that began a work of reformation. From that church, the careless and indifferent the spirit of discord and strife will be banished. Take note also of these words, spirit of discord and strife. Now this is very important and we have to take care of our own selves because if we are careless indifferent, if we have a spirit of discord and strife, certainly we will be banished from this company that began a work of reformation. By banishing from the church the spirit of discord and strife, by shaking out from the church the careless and indifferent, the church will be purified. About the purification of the church, we read a few statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. Testimonies for the Church, page 186. And 187. The heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out Jesus. This fearful message will do its work. And here it is talking about the message to Laodicea, the counsel given to Laodicea. I saw that this message would not accomplish its work in a few short months. 
It is designed to arouse the people of God, to discover to them their backslidings, to lead them to zealous repentance, that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. As this message affected the heart, it led to deep humility before God. Further down, said the angel, God is weighing his people. If the message had been of as short duration as many of us supposed, there would have been no time for them to develop character. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will receive the latter rain and thus be fitted for translation. Did you notice that the shaking would continue, shaking out the careless and indifferent, the spirit of discord and strife, so that everyone may have time to develop character. And to develop character is not a work of a short duration. There is no doubt that the church, the remnant church, which undertakes a work of reformation, will become a pure church. In Evangelism, page 702, we read, Today you are to have your vessel purified, that it may be ready for the heavenly dew, ready for the showers of the latter rain. For the latter rain will come, and the blessing of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. It is our work today to yield our souls for Christ, that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here an individual work as members of the church is focused. And we have to undertake this work, individual work, of purifying our souls through obedience to the truth and purified from every defilement to fit us for the outpouring of the latter rain. About the church as a whole to be pure, the Bible tells us the condition in which the church must be found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. Let's read from verse 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The Bible tells us that the church of God will reach that condition to be a purified church without spot, without wrinkle, without defect, but holy, irreprehensible, without blemish. And in the spirit of prophecy, we read in volume 1, page 99, God is sifting his people. He will have a clean and holy church. We cannot read the heart of men, but the Lord has provided means to keep the church pure. God is purifying His church by the mighty shaking or mighty sifting. Shaking out the careless 
the indifferent, the spirit of discord and strife. In volume. Yeah.